Okay, hello everyone. It's really good to see all of you. Um, many we are familiar with from the team community and also some new people. And so I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Tyann and I am a level four uh, team CBT therapist and trainer. I am just super passionate about team CBT and have seen it to really be life-changing not just for the clients that I work with, but for, for all of us as practitioners too. I think it's hard for it to not just change the fiber of who we are once we dive into this treatment approach. And my first license is actually as a licensed alcohol and drug counselor. So my first passion is working with addictions. And um, my new ignited passion is actually understanding a little bit more of overeating, binge eating, um, emotional eating. And so that's where I found um, the Am I Hungry program from Dr. Michelle May. And she has a program that's a 10 week program called Mindful Eating for Binge Eating that therapists and dietitians use to treat binge eating and overeating. And it's been clinically shown to stop and help people overcome binge eating in, in 10 weeks. And so I found it to be really impressive statistically. And I have a dietitian friend here in Oklahoma who runs these courses, these groups, and she vouches for the effectiveness of it. And she said, I know it may sound kind of arrogant or um, unbelievable, but actually almost every person who goes through their 10 week program stops binging by the end of it. And they use measurement, which I know us as team CBT therapists just um, really are drawn to because they're not just wondering if someone stopped binging. They actually use a measurement called the binge eating scale and they use it at the first session, the fifth session and at the end of the, the last session. And so they'll see scores change to the point where there's no more binge eating behaviors. And I had Urban fill out a binge eating scale just to show you. And what we'll do today is do a full demo of going through TEAM, which is the testing portion. I'll review some of his uh, testing scores from the binge eating scale. I'll also um, do some empathy with Urban. I wanna reconnect with him and check in with him to see how he's doing. And um, to just be completely transparent with everyone. Um, this is not, the binge eating aspect is not my area of expertise. I've actually had like two failed treatments of trying to help two clients through binge eating. And so this is a process that I am learning as a new, a new person learning about eating disorders. So we're just gonna demo the aspects that I know well, which is team CBT. And then I'm trying to incorporate some of the aspects of the mindful eating to make it more effective. Because while Team CBT, I think, has really got it down on treating depression, anxiety, and, and mood problems, I think we fall a little bit short when it comes to eating issues. And so um, I think the combination of both of these treatment approaches is going to be the most powerful in helping, helping Urban and others more effectively. For the sake of our two hours today, though, we're not doing a demo to uh, help Urban through his struggles like we do with mood work. Um, we are just strictly demonstrating how some of the tools could work because this process is most effective done weekly so we could actually track behavioral changes and give time um, for behavioral changes too. It needs more of that week to week progress instead of trying to do it all in two hours like we do with mood work. It just seems to be a little bit of a, a different creature working with addictions versus the mood aspects. So. Um, okay, so before we jump in, I'd like to share with you the binge eating skill where you can have access to it here. <clears throat> I'm gonna screen share with you Urban's binge eating skill. And then Hannah's here. She says, um, thanks for taking the time to offer the webinar on a much needed topic. Thank you so much, Hannah, for your kind feedback there. Yeah, I found this to, it's kind of ignited a passion in me. Um, Binge eating and overeating is actually the most common eating disorder, although we hear a lot more surrounding anorexia and bulimia. Um, yeah, I think this is more prevalent and it's more of what I've seen in my practice as well. And do you all have any questions before we jump in to begin to look at Urban's uh, 
binge eating scale and then we'll do some empathy. Any questions or thoughts on the format of today or what we're addressing today before we jump in? It's great to see you, Lisa. I just noticed you popped on there. And Sorry, it's so great to see you. Sorry's been with me from the beginning three years ago on my first webinar. <laughs> I think we had like 10 people sign up. <laughs> And it wasn't very good, but she somehow stuck through it with me. And it's been great connecting for three years now. Um, okay, so let me screen share the binge eating scale. <clears throat> and Urban, thank you also for completing it and being willing to be so vulnerable like for one, just volunteering your, your struggles for everyone to learn from and for everyone to be able to see your answers. I think sometimes it's vulnerable for us to do that. So I just first wanted to sincerely appreciate your openness and vulnerability in this process. And people couldn't get enough of Urban. We were just gonna do part two, but um, a lot of people requested a part three with more of the live demos. So that's why we're here. Okay, so this is, is the binge eating scale. This is the one that they use through their 10 week program, Dr. Michelle May does. <clears throat> and so they also uh, assess um, body image in addition to eating behaviors. So Urban puts that, um, he thinks about his appearance and weight and feels disappointment about that. Um, with eating behaviors sometimes, there's a feeling of being too full, uh, feeling like he has less control over food than the average person, but not to the point of where it's an inability to control, where some people would um, put down there. <clears throat> um, don't really eat when you're bored. I think more of your triggers was when you're tired and exhausted after work, and then also kind of struggling with loneliness or feeling disconnected. That seems like more of your emotional triggers. Do I have that right, Irvin? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, and then you talked about like often eating to satisfy hunger, um, <clears throat> but it gets to the point sometimes that I've, I've already eaten enough. And on these occasions, because I'm eating past the point of hunger, I can't enjoy what I eat. Right. Okay. Uh, um, they also really see in binge eating. So all of us as human beings, even the most intuitive eaters will overeat from time to time, whether it's because the meal tastes really good or you're distracted, you're watching a show or you're just connecting with friends. So more often than not when we're overeating as intuitive eater, there isn't a lot of self beating or guilt and shame afterwards. Um, but we see more so of that with binge eating disorder, where um, it isn't just like, oh, I ate too much. I, I'll just kind of listen to my body and adjust and eat less later. With binge eating, we see more of extreme emotions afterwards, where it's like, I hate myself. I feel really guilty. I feel ashamed. Um, we've even seen a high, higher depression and anxiety, and even some clients feel suicidal after a binge as well. And so Urban has talked about, um, I almost always feel a strong sense of guilt and regret afterwards. Can you tell me a little bit more about that, Urban? Uh, yeah, I mean, some questions kind of uh, were a little bit awkward for me because I like mm -hmm. ones particularly that had to do with uh, shame because I, I don't really believe in, <laughs> believe in shame there. Uh, but definitely, you know, yeah, I mean, I always feel, you know, like I did, you know, I did a bad thing, obviously, because I you know, uh, ate too much or, you know, I didn't pay close enough attention. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm like over full. Mm -hmm. So, you know, regretting that, you know, oh, why, you know, why didn't I, uh, you know, why wasn't I more conscious or why didn't I, you know, stop eating or. Mm -hmm. Did, did I hear right? You said it felt uh, some of the wording in the questionnaire felt awkward because you said you don't really believe in shame or you don't really feel shame. Uh, I don't feel, yeah, I don't really feel shame. I, in that time. I mean, I've, I've I spent a lot, a lot of time in my life to eliminate shame. So like mm -hmm. the questions that might've, I might've clicked, but because it had the wording about shame in it, it's like, yeah, no, it doesn't really apply to me. 
I see. Um, but there's just like a, a stronger sense of regret or maybe guilt that resonates yeah, more I, with you. I, I associate guilt is I did a bad thing and shame is I'm a bad person. Mm. So, you know, it's more yeah. guilt than shame. Yeah, I think that's beautiful that you've worked through shame and that it no longer is internalized as like, I'm bad. Um, but there is regrets about the behavior. Like, I wish I've eaten more consciously. Um, I should have stopped. But it doesn't go to the space of I'm a bad person. No, I mean, no, I mean, not in not in those instances. You know, I mean, I might, you know, look at myself in the mirror one day or something, try to shame myself. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the, those questions weren't on there. I see. So there may be more shame surrounding the body image aspect, but not so much the eating behaviors. Right. Do I hear that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that so vulnerably to Urban. I know you've done a lot of, a lot of self-work. I mean, just from connecting with you the first time where you said you've worked really hard to stop smoking. Um, you've worked hard to get a lot more active um, and just a lot of different like lifestyle changes. And now hearing too, that you've worked really hard on that inner work of um, not internalizing to the point of like, I'm bad or getting to that space of self-hatred, right? Because that's another aspect of really important work too, I think. Um, can you all see the binge eating slow? I'm making sure I shared the right screen. Can you all see that? That binge eating skill? Okay, good. Um, okay, so more of a strong sense of guilt after you eat. So there may be thoughts that beat yourself up surrounding the behaviors. I should have stopped. Why didn't I eat more consciously, et cetera? Okay. Um, it's rare that I eat so much that I felt uncomfortably full. Oh, so that this one is, uh, you had marked that there are regular periods during the month when you eat large amounts of food at meals or in between meals. Um, and I think uh, when we were working together on the first one that I forgot to record, you said it'll, it'll be multiple times a week, right? Especially after work where you would be really tempted and then follow through. Yeah, periods of time. And I mean, this, this of course, I took this to be when I'm not actively, you know, dieting or restricting food intake or, you know. Say that again. I, 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 I answered the question in terms of when I'm not actively uh, restricting my food intake or, or, or dieting, right? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're saying when you're not restricting or dieting. Then there wouldn't be none of these would apply mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um, as we've seen in the previous webinar that it's actually really important to address restricting behaviors because with mindful eating we notice that the more that we restrict the more we're actually likely to binge and through Dr. May's research they've even found that all of their clients who recovered from binge eating after their work their 10-week um, therapy group the only ones that worsened in some binge eating symptoms again were the ones that got back into a diet or some form of restrictive eating. Um, so that's really interesting how those directly um, link to each other. The more I'm willing, uh, likely to restrict or get into another diet, the more likely I'll continue to binge again. Okay, I have a habit of eating too much at night. You had shared that with us, that it's not really the morning or while you're working, it's mainly at night. Sometimes I feel the urge to eat um, that I cannot control. And Urban had even quote unquote said it could possibly be a food ad addiction for him. And um, Dr. May and some other of the books that I'm reading, one, one really good book is called Eight Keys to Recover from an Eating Disorder. Um, they talk about it's actually not so much the chemical makeup of the food that makes us addicted um, as we see messages in our culture that, oh, that food is poison or horrible and they put all of these addictive stuff in it and while there may be some truth in that um, they see it's more of the chemical makeup of what's going on with the person that leads them into engaging in binge eating behaviors and so their goal is actually to really no longer villainize any food as too addictive too bad too much sugar too much carbs um, any food can be a part of a healthy diet. And the key is actually looking at the person and what is going on with them that leads them in that moment to turn to this, this habit in order to cope or 
um, have a voice about something that's not being addressed, right? And when we look at it in that way, um, we see a lot of, like there's a lot more depth to this behavior than, oh, it was just this food that tastes really good or it's just this food that's really addictive. Okay, so sometimes I feel an urge to eat. Okay, we already went through that one. I can usually stop eating when I feel full, but sometimes I eat so much it feels unpleasant. Um, and that aligns with what you shared with us, Urban, that most of the day you feel fine. It's mainly after work with some of those emotional triggers. Sometimes I do not eat what I want around others because I am aware of my problems with food. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that on not eating around others? Uh, just, you know, like if I'm out somewhere, uh, you know, like a, a social or something like that, I'm probably more likely to, you know, not eat the things that if it was at, if it was at my house, I would probably eat, or if I was, you know, by myself. I Urban, I don't know if you know your video is off and then your audio is just a little bit small. The audio is what, slow? It's just a, a kind of smaller than it was. Is, is it like that for everyone else where it's a, just a little bit harder to hear? A little bit, okay, see some not head nods there. Uh, yeah, I, what I was saying was uh, I, I, would, I would be more, inclined in a social setting to be more aware of not eating certain th certain things or uh, you know not not eating as much as what I would normally eat at home say oh yeah so if it's a social setting you'd limit what you're eating <clears throat> and um, you you more likely eat more of that when you're at home alone right yeah yeah, and that's also common in what they see with um, <clears throat> with binge eating, where it does get to a space where it's less, there are some aspects of it's more private eating and less of that social, social public eating, or the behaviors are, are different in two of the settings, right? Um, sometimes, okay, I eat three meals a day. I usually snack as well. Uh, my mind is busy most of the time with thoughts about eating. I seem to be constantly fighting not to eat. Yeah, that also sounds kind of um, just challenging or torturous. I wonder what that's like for you when it feels like, oh, my life's kind of consumed by it or my mind is busy with thoughts of food. How does that affect you throughout the day? Uh, I mean, part of it is just life, right? Like, I mean, I, uh, I, I spend... Part of my time away from my private practice in uh, in a in a group home setting, so uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm cooking them food. So like you know what I mean? It's like you <laughs> you spend most of the day like you get up in the morning. What am I gonna make later for supper for these guys? Uh, yeah. You know, and then what am I gonna eat? And, and you know, so it's like the whole day sort of revolves around uh, food and, and thinking about. You know, how, am I hungry? Am I, you know, uh, am I full? Or, you know, all, all those kind of things. So it really just sort of becomes a, a day of where we're, that's all we're doing is thinking about food, really. Uh, I mean, it probably isn't all day because sure. obviously I wouldn't get any other work done if that was the case. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, and, I, and on a restrictive uh, diet, then yeah, most of the time, the thoughts are on what you can't have. Exactly. Yeah. Or, you know, how much it sucks that you can't have it. <laughs> uh -huh. And how do you think that's affected you when you are on a diet and the thoughts are kind of consumed with, oh, I can't have this, I can't have that, or this really sucks that I can't? Uh, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, the, the, the definitely the, you know, that it's, that it's, you know, it's it's unfair, like feelings that, that it's unfair that you know. I mean, other people can eat, you know, crap all the time and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and not have any issues, and I, you know, but I do. So, yeah. uh, I mean, that's you know, logically, I can, under, you know, I can I can get it and understand that, you know, that's it's uh, you know, an addiction or like, you know, it's. Uh, wiring or whatever the, whatever the case might be but you know like I mean other people have other issues as well so uh, 
but I mean, definitely in the moment, it's it's uh, not pleasant, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you find that, especially when you're on a diet or in a restrictive eating cycle, um, there are, it sounds like maybe feelings of resentment or unfairness as well, where that really does suck that others seem to eat freely, just fine. And I'm in this space where I'm really deprived. And what Dr. May has found actually is why restrictive eating leads to a binge is because of that actually, where it gets to the space where I feel so deprived and I continue to consume my mind with don't eat this, don't do that. And that is very much like that don't think of pink elephants mindset. And then that's all you think of. And then you're much actually more likely to go towards it because you're one telling yourself you can't have it. You're more likely then to think about it. Um, and two, it brings on all of these feelings that you want to suppress, like feelings of resentment, feelings of unfairness. And then it also probably for a lot of people brings on feelings of inadequacy or kind of feeling alienated, like why am I the odd one out or why am I the one struggling in this way? And it can be kind of a lonely process too, where it feels like everyone doesn't have to be consumed by thinking of food. Um, on number 15, you said there are some days when I think of nothing but food. And then sometimes I'm not quite sure if I'm physically hungry or I'm just using food um, to kind of cope there. So yeah, you get into the restrictive eating and it sounds like you're saying at the very least it's very unpleasant. And then at its worst, it feels very depriving. You feel resentful. And I'm wondering if it resonates with you that it could also be kind of that lonely process where you feel like the odd one out or why, why does it have to be this way for me? Yeah, maybe a little bit. A little bit of that too, yeah. Just can feel sometimes a little bit of a lonely process. And I've started to use some of these tools um, to integrate into our current team tools with one client who, who shared about binge eating. And I've already seen that it's creating more um, awareness and effectiveness than just strictly using the team tools that we had. Because I think Dr. Burns's conceptualization of the only thing that makes people overeat or binge is just how good that food tastes it just seems to lack a little bit of depth on, on the complexities, right? Um, and I even had a therapist friend who said, it feels actually kind of insulting um, for her personally when she heard like, oh, you're just engaging in this because that, that food tastes so good. And if you could just stop, your whole life would be better or different, right? And and what we're seeing through more of the eating disorder research is that it's so much more than the food. And a lot of the research even shows like, it's not even about the food. This is, this is actually just something that I've turned to that has worked for me um, to escape pain, suffering, trauma, loneliness, disconnection. Almost always there's something that has more depth than I'm just turning to this thing because it tastes really good. Right. And what they see too is a lot of times they're not tasting it, um, that it's actually even in like a trance state, a disconnected state, a dissociative state. So it's, so it's actually the opposite of I'm, I'm doing this because I can't control it because it tastes so good. Um, I'm actually almost disconnected. And there are some people that um, through their research, they found like, I'm actually so disconnected. I'm in shock that I finished that whole bucket of M&Ms by the end of it, or um, I'm kind of just disgusted at myself afterwards because of how physically badly I feel, but it wasn't a conscious process of I'm eating this because it tastes good. I'm wondering if you relate to some of those aspects, Urban. Uh, yeah, I mean, a little bit. I mean, just, you know, sort of thinking about that, that uh, you know, I, I think it is definitely oversimplified to say, you know, that there are people are eating it just because it tastes good or whatever. I mean, People will, you know, overeat, uh, you know, carrots. I mean, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I carrots. I mean, carrots are okay. I mean, they, they, you know, I, I don't, I don't dislike carrots, but I mean, uh, right. I, I, I wouldn't sit and eat a whole bag of carrots. Like, you know what I mean? That's, I, you know, I, I might eat a whole, uh, you know, bag of chocolates or something, but I wouldn't eat a whole bag of carrots. But 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it, might be, it might be better if I ate a bag of carrots. I don't know. But um, yeah, so I mean, there, there definitely are, there is there is some of that there for sure. Really. Yeah, you agree with it seems oversimplified, but it's just. Yeah, and, I, and I think that there's probably, uh, I, I think in my case, is there's, there's, I, I mean, anybody's case, really, I think there have, there probably is some type of, uh, well, there's, there's a good reason for, for why that behavior began, uh, whatever that is. I don't really know what it is for myself uh, or how it started or why it started. Uh, I just know that it's, it, it's there. And, uh, you know, I mean, Mm-hmm. So got to deal with it, right? So it's not a uh, maybe the why and the how it's there aren't aren't all that important, but I think there probably was some type of you know psychological trauma or or event or something that mm-hmm. precipitated the using the the food as replacement of of need fulfillment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's a really good question of when did it start or why did it start? And for some people, it could be learned behavior from family. Um, for others, it's actually growing up in a family that did a lot of dieting and restricting. And so the more that they try to tell you like, oh, you're getting too big, don't eat this, don't eat that, you're then actually much more likely to want it or to feel a sense of control when you get something that you've been told you shouldn't have. And if you eat it, you'll get to a size where you're not good enough, right? So um, yeah, they're, they're doing a lot of uh, different research of like, when did it start for people, why? And for some, it's a, a learned behavior from parents. For others, it's a family that was so focused on dieting and restricting um, that the more I'm told to not do that, the more I actually want it. And for others, it was uh, when they're disconnecting from trauma, um, their bodies also disconnect from just listening to itself. And so then they disconnect from hunger cues too. And so then they're just much more likely to turn to also not listening to their bodies when they're eating. And then there's a piece of food that then feels really comforting. Um, then it feels like that companion for a lot of people. Um, there's a question on the chat that I'm just seeing now from Misa. Um, is this binge eating skill at amihungry.com? And I'll send that link to all of you again. And then um, with the one woman that I'm uh, using some of these tools with, uh, I just use this just like the brief mood survey and use it as an empathy tool to assess just where she's at on some of her behaviors there. Okay, so... Um, We've done some of the testing and I'm trying to use it as an empathy tool. We're understanding a little bit more that there's guilt afterwards. You said there's some shame when it comes to body image, although not so much with the eating behaviors, um, but with body image. So for you, that plays a part as well. And um, other aspects that we're understanding that comes up for you is loneliness, feelings of inadequacy, big triggers after work and I'm feeling just disconnected, I'm feeling exhausted. This, if I heard you right from the last time, it feels like it's the one good thing in my life. Sometimes it's that companionship with the sweets that feels maybe good or comforting or connecting. Um, do I understand those aspects correctly and summarize that correctly, Urban? Yeah, I think so sometimes. I mean, I, I, I have noticed uh, more so this last week of like, um, definitely periods of the day when uh, I'm more more uh, like trying to determine whether or not there are actual periods of the day where I'm reaching for that that those kind of snacks or the, the you know or you know feeling like uh, these are you know I'm I'm hungry but you know like <laughs> mm-hmm. not not uh, I don't know yeah just like like I noticed definitely evenings was, was a pattern. Uh, this last week, I noticed like around four o'clock that was uh, before I'm, before, as I'm sort of making supper for, for the boys in the group home, uh, that that's when I would notice that I would be hungry and be reaching for like, you know, uh, not healthy snacks, so. Mm-hmm. 
So more, you're starting to be a bit more aware of, then, of yeah, when. I would be tempted to have it, right? So, mm. so you, you cook for the boys at the group home as well? Uh, suckers, yeah. Okay. How, how long, what are the hours of that job? Because I remember you saying it was around eight when you were more likely to. Uh, no, they're mostly like 12 hours, like 11 and a half or something. So um, mm. I have to work from like basically 8.30 to 8 p.m. Oh, I, wow. I guess I yeah, I remember you worked with youth, but I didn't realize it was at a group home. And so they're a bit more severe than with whether it's sometimes psychosis or behavioral problems. Is is that the population that you work with? Uh, they're, I mean, they're 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 youth that are, I mean, they have a variety of different things. But I mean, they're all Ministry of Social Services uh, youth, so youth who have been through foster care or mm -hmm. basically been removed from their homes, uh, or living on a street or through the legal system or whatever the case might be. So. We, mm -hmm. we have all kinds of uh, of youth now that are, you know, some have addictions, some have legal issues, some just have no parents, or their parents are locked up, or uh, or deceased, or whatever. The ministry has stepped in and seized the seized the kids and and removed them, and we just are uh, basically an orphanage, essentially. It's, you know, they call them orphanages anymore. They call them group homes, but that's basically mm -hmm. what it is. Oh, wow. Um, so it feels more like an orphanage. These are kids who are in foster care who don't have parents. Uh, well, yeah, or, or <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they might have parents, but their parents aren't involved or they've been, the children have been removed from the home and or from their, you know, removed from their family home mm -hmm. and have no contact with their parents or yeah. limited contact. So it varies really from you know <laughs> we get all we get all kinds of youth coming in so mm -hmm. yeah um so no consistent parental figure so you're kind of like a dad figure to them then you're making meals for them as well pretty much i mean we're i i work in a 16 plus home so uh we're trying to get these guys ready for independence so you know there's a lot of things that we're that we're working on with them in terms of you know, uh, just trying, yeah, for them to navigate, uh, being able to navigate the world on their own, because that's, once they hit 18, that's, they're an adult, so it's kind of sort of on their own, or there's certain conditions that might extend that to, like, say, 21, but uh, they, they need to learn some skills, and that's, that's kind of where, where mm -hmm. we're, what we're doing in that, and uh, we always make sure that we're the ones that are trying to make them, you know, supper every night and, and uh, you know, the rest of the time they're kind of on their own, so. Yeah, um, it sounds like a population that can sometimes be kind of stressful or involves a lot of energy from you. Because oh, yeah. yeah. I know you parent to your own two children and then you have all of these 16 and 21 year olds that you're parenting to in a way in the group home. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very much like being a parent, but it's, you know, I mean, and then, of course, we have our, I mean, I have my sort of counseling responsibilities with these guys that we're doing a sort of more one on one individual mm -hmm. uh, in, in informal settings. So, uh, you know, but and, and that might vary from, you know, addictions issues to just sort of anger management, life issues, uh, mm -hmm. trying to get towards, towards school. Uh, yeah career focus, goal, goal focus. Yeah, I mean, it can be, it can be a very uh, frustrating uh, mm -hmm. type of job if you, <laughs> you know, if you allow, if you allow it to be, right? But, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just really admire the work that you do there. And I also see from our last time talking together that you really care about them. You care about doing a good job there and you cared about being able to relax so you could be your best self for those kids too. Yeah, because I just admire that, the grit that you have to be in that setting 11 to 12 hours um, at a time too. So let me go ahead and uh, share the results of your um, binge eating skill. They call it the BES. 
Okay. Can you all see that okay? Okay, so for Urban, with his answers, he scored a 24. And so he's in the moderate range. Um, they've seen people be in the moderate or severe when they first start the program. And then um, almost everyone gets to the zero to 17, little to no uh, binge eating behavior by the end of the 10 week group. So I'd like to uh, begin to demonstrate some of the tools, but before I go there, um, Urban, did you have anything else you'd like to share with the group or anything to update us on regarding um, your understanding of as you're getting more awareness surrounding binge eating and uh, just what the scores mean for you? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, the, the score didn't really, well, I mean, it sort of surprised me, but, uh, and, and I think it might be higher mm -hmm. um, just based on like, I'm not very good at doing surveys because I am too like philosophical and <laughs> you know, debate all the answers whether or not they actually apply or in what situation and yeah I have to pick something and answer it so like you know, don't think too hard about it but uh, so I, I I would say it's it's probably I mean 24 is not very low on the moderate scale so right. uh, I would say it's it's probably pretty close to the higher end of that moderate scale mm -hmm. you know it might still be moderate but uh it's definitely high moderate to very low severe mm -hmm. yeah so kind, kind of surprised that it wasn't higher actually for you um that you see it's at the 24 but likely on that higher end maybe closer to 26 and two i think the 16 question questionnaire is kind of extensive i think i think dr burns could probably do something with it in his statistical machines that could really make it a lot more efficient <laughs> Because, you know, the GAT, the um, Beck's depression and the Burns depression inventory were like 60 questions. And he shortened it down to just those five questions on the brief food survey. So I have a feeling we could do something like that with this as well. Yeah, the only yeah. thing that I would add in terms of the, the mindfulness that I find challenging mm -hmm. uh, is that... <laughs> Like I, I know you're trying, you're trying to be conscious of the fact that you know, am I hungry when you know when yeah. I think I'm hungry, uh, and asking yourself that. But a lot of times, like I don't think people who you know have eating issues necessarily for like for myself are, are really all aware of what it really means to to you know say, oh yeah, I am full. Like I mean, I know the difference oh, between. Yeah. I know what overfull is like, <laughs> you know, but there, there's a there's a there's a big room between full and overfull, right? So, um, I think you almost need you almost need some training beyond just the the being mindful about you know where where you are in terms of your hunger scale. That mm -hmm. you have to kind of almost spend time with the person to. Uh, like figure out all those different gra graduations of that hunger scale. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great point. Um, and they do mention that as well, that initially if you've been um, consistently overeating or binge eating, your your norm is actually an overfullness where, where that feels like the norm for you, right? And so you're saying as you're assessing, am I at a healthy level of fullness or am I overly full? It's, it's kind of complex and confusing starting off in that way, trying to be mindful of your body. Um, and they definitely talk about it taking time and that there are a lot of different tools to get there to that space of allowing your body to recognize through various different cues, not just the fullness that, oh, I'm at a space where I'm treating my body well and responding to it, like energy level afterwards. Um, they track different things like concentration and focus. When I overeat, I actually feel kind of sluggish. Um, so just other things that they have people be more aware of too. And one, just one of the pieces is the hunger and fullness scale. And they have different things to help people identify aspects of that too. Um, that's, that's more than just intuitively how does it feel for you because it actually takes some time for it to get there to, to get more awareness so that's a really good point 
Um, I'm wondering if this is a good time, Urban, for us to transition to some of the tools portion, or was there anything else that would feel important for me and the group to understand before we go there? No, I think we're okay. I think we're okay. Okay. Um, how does it feel so far um, just on the empathy and just understanding uh, your struggles so far? Uh, like yeah, zero to 10. You have a pretty good understanding of kind of all the things in the three sessions that we've had that uh, yeah, pretty good summary. Right, and I appreciate you volunteering for the third time just for the sake of the demo of the tools here. Um, I wanted to give a quick overview for those of you who weren't there or if you were there, it was several months ago that we did the first session with Urban. And this was pieces of his habits and addiction log. The moment in time was after work around eight when he gets off. Um, then he's feeling really tired and exhausted. Um, and these feelings we uncovered later on um, from the last session, um, but some inadequacy too. And then I didn't get the rating for lonely. Um, where would you rate that zero to hundred if you were to dive yourself into that day after work, it's around eight, you're tired, you're exhausted. Where would you rate lonely feeling zero to a hundred? Uh, uh, I guess it would, it's sort of, well, I don't know, it, it, it would change this from time to time, but yeah, you know, so I don't know, I would say maybe like 70%. About 70. Um, and then these were some of your attempting thoughts. You're saying it's mainly around sweets and how good it tastes, it's satisfying, you're tired and it kind of just helps you unwind. And I'd like to just uncover thoughts um, that are tempting in the moment, not so much now to talk back to the thoughts like Dr. Burns has initially done um, and why I found that to be uh, a bit concerning now that we understand restrictive eating is it seems to feed into restrictive eating. If we're telling them like, hey, I'm gonna be that tempting voice and you talk back to me and I say things like, oh, go ahead and eat that donut. It's gonna be so good. And your job is to tell yourself to like villainize that food. Don't eat it, it's poison, it's bad for you. It actually feeds into restrictive eat, the restrictive eating mindset and then you're much more likely to want it. And so I think we need to shift that aspect of um, villainizing the food with the devil's advocate, whether it's the chips, the popcorn, or the sweets to actually looking at the behaviors. And maybe we could do the temptation surrounding the behaviors like, oh, you should binge now, or you should really restrict your eating. And then maybe they could be more effective in defeating it. But I no longer use these thoughts for the devil's advocate for them to talk back to. Where I find it to be really helpful is that it helps to give me um, more information on what are the benefits that they get from the food. Because he'll say things like, I'm tired, so it helps me to unwind. So it sounds like there's something in there that helps him to relax, right? Um, and then I deserve it after a nice day. And let me see what else. Um, it's enjoyable. This is the parts where I feel like I can enjoy life. So then we did the traditional triple paradox. And now we're gonna uncover this new and improved um, binge restrict triple paradox. And then we'll see where that goes. So um, before we go there, I'd like to ask the magic button and the miracle of cure question again as well. Um, so when I had previously asked Urban, if there was a button that you could push and you'd no longer binge eat, and that would just be out of your life. You'd have a healthy relationship with food. Would you wanna push that button? And Urban said, yes. And motivation was at a hundred. I'm wondering if that still feels the same, Urban? If uh, I were to ask you the same uh, question with the button. Yeah. yeah, I would say it's about the same, about the same level. Yeah, um, where's your uh, motivation zero to a hundred to change that behavior now? Uh, I it's probably close to 100, you know, like 95 percent. 95. Uh -huh. Okay. I'm definitely more. Uh, uh, I don't know. I think maybe I'm a little bit more prepared uh, or starting to prepare for that mm -hmm. than back when maybe we first did this. It was in the summer. Oh yeah, absolutely. You're actually feeling more prepared for it. 
uh, well, or, or start like feeling like I'm, I'm starting to prepare myself for it. I see. Yeah. Um, I appreciate Vic's, I hope I pr I'm pronouncing your name right. In the chat, she said, I understand lonely eating. Um, and I think we can actually all understand at a certain level of turning to food for comfort um, when we're feeling down or lonely or, or bored. <laughs> oh, she wants the magic button too. <laughs> and the magic button's there to assess, do they actually want this outcome that they're expressing that they're wanting? And then we want to get paradoxical. So he's saying, yes, I want to push that button. I was at 100. I'm pretty close to it. I'm at 95. I feel more readiness towards it or that he's uh, working himself up for getting ready for it. Um, and then we get paradoxical. And at the same time, Urban, before we do the work to get there, there may be some really good reasons to continue this process. It sounds like you get a lot out of it. And we've already uncovered all of the benefits of binging. I think there were some big ones where you said it's just, it feels really good. It's satisfying, um, but it's actually just a, a space of escape or of relaxation or a break from the hard work, from sleep. And you said, I don't want to just go to work and go home and sleep and get up to go to work again. I just want some me time to unwind. I watch a show, um, connect with the food, and it feels really good. It's enjoyable. It's self-care. And you said that that relaxation actually allows you to be more effective with under, being more understanding with your own children and the, the youth the youths that you work with. Are they all boys? Is it an all boy group? Uh, yes, yeah, all boys. All, all boys, boys too. Usually, I mean, sometimes we have we have trans youth as well. So. Oh, got it. Uh -huh. sure. Yeah. So you'll have like uh, female to male trans boys. Yes there um and your children do you have two boys or is it a boy and a girl I, I two girls are 17 and 21 17 and 21 girls and then you deal with all boys in the day and two girls <laughs> in the night <laughs> okay yeah that can be a lot for sure 17 and 21 at that um let's look at the benefits and values of restricting because when we're talking about mindful eating there is some cost which they do want people to completely let go of restricting letting go of diet culture completely um, because we actually see it's counterproductive to stopping binging when we continue to restrict or to diet um, but at the same time there may likely be some benefits of restricting too like those moments when you're getting in a diet, or I remember you saying like in the day, I'm pretty good, where you actually feel good about yourself if you're restricting to um, a, a, that, I, I forgot what exactly the meal was, but it was like chicken or something. You, you said you'd feel good about yourself or something along those lines during the day, um, if you just restrict, or you said something along the lines of like, I've been good all day. It's only at night that I I feel like I'm out of control or something like that. Um, so would that be a benefit for you where you feel like good about yourself or in control or something like that when you restrict? Uh, yeah. Maybe. I mean, I, I think there, I think there's the benefit of restricting. Like, I don't know. I, I have a really hard time. Um, I don't know if it's like acceptance or what, but like, I think there are certain types of food uh, that I simply have to restrict, like sugar, for example, um, or, or, yeah, I, and, I, and I might not be like completely eliminate, but I think at some point initially, my goal would be to eliminate it with the potential of reintroducing it in a moderate to mild way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where initially, even if it's in the home, it feels too high risk as a binge food <clears throat> for you with sugar or chocolates. You know, like if all the, you know, all the, all the Christmas stuff is there, uh, I'm gonna eat it. <laughs> so like, when we get it gone, then it's not around. Like, I'm not going to go to the store and buy more of it, or I'm not going to make more of it. I'm going to, you know, um, 
eliminate it. But, you know, I mean, there's, there's sugar in pretty much, I'm, I'm really seeing like there's sugar in pretty much everything that we eat in mm -hmm. Western today. Like, I, I, think, mm. I don't know what you can yeah. buy that doesn't have, have sugar in it. So, uh, you know, or what you can make that doesn't have sugar, you know, like any, any sauce, any, uh, I mean, pretty much everything. I mean, pretty much everything I eat probably has sugar in it in some variation. And when I did keto for a year, uh, I didn't have any sugar, but I did have, but I did use like art, uh, artificial sweetener. It's like stevia. Right. So, but apparently like from what I've under my research is suggesting that those artificial sweeteners are do kind of the same thing as sugar they're just not mm -hmm. as bad for you or something like i mean the, the the brain doesn't really know the difference i so i mm -hmm. i feel like uh i need to restrict those sugars mm -hmm. sweeteners uh or you know artificial sugars uh initially as much as possible uh with kind of the ability to maybe bring it back in some form down down the line when I have a better control over, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, not, not using the sugar or something. What's the benefit of restricting sugar? Um, is that does it help you to feel? Um, well, I, I like think you're that, helping your health uh, or in control. <clears throat> Yeah, I think it would, it would it would give me more control, uh, you know, throughout the day because most of the times when I'm searching for, you know, uh, snacks or things that because I, I you know think that I'm hungry or whatever the case might be, or maybe I really am hungry. I don't know. Uh, it, it probably like I would say eighty percent of the time is is probably sugar or chocolate or something you know, like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because one of the costs with mindful eating um, that a lot of people initially resist is allowing yourself to actually go towards those foods that you want to control. Their motto is actually control is not the solution. Control is the problem because I want to control this and I tell myself this food is bad. Um, then I'm more likely to tell myself to not go there, don't do it and then feel deprived. And that sense of deprivation is then what leads me to binge on it. There is a good comment though in the chat that they said people with diabetes have to restrict. There is a whole book called Mindful Eating um, for pre-diabetes and diabetes where they see that you can use mindfulness even for people with diabetes, heart disease, uh, with mindful eating, I mean, I'm sorry. Um, and my dietitian friend who works with binge eating and people with diabetes, heart disease, among other diagnoses, she says that I can help people manage their blood sugar completely through mindful eating. And they, they also don't have to be in a space where they feel deprived um, and they don't need insulin either, which I find to be really amazing and a hopeful message, but it is a different process they still want to use mindful eating and listening to your body. Um, so they said you can still drink pop. You can still um, eat all the things that you want to eat, but how do you feel afterwards? So you still want to be in a space where you feel good afterwards. So obviously if you drink like a 44 ounce, you're not going to feel as good as if you just drink an eight ounce. So part of the mindful eating is also being mindful of and intentional of wanting to feel better after I eat instead of worse. And so there are there are specific strategies for people with diabetes. Um, so that's a good I, comment. I think kind of what, what I what I'm what I'm suggesting is that like initially, like I I just know that like I can't just have like one chocolate, like you know, because mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm gonna I, I'm gonna eat I don't. Know, 20 of them or something, you know, or whatever's, you know, whatever's there, uh, you know, or, can or, or whatever. Because, I, and, and that's what, and, and that restricting thing is going to be there. Because I can say I'm going to have one, but then I'm thinking about, oh, no, I only had one. I only have one. I'm going to have more. I'm going to have more. And you just end up, yeah, you just end up having more of it. So if I totally eliminate it and not have it initially till I have enough control to, be able to you know i don't know bring it into my 
mindfulness of or my <laughs> wired into my brain that you know one is okay but for right now i need to establish a pattern of like none because right now i don't have that control yeah so if i eliminate sugar confident in the control um, then maybe i can i can uh you know then, then i would be much more inclined to say yeah okay you know like there's there is no food that's sort of like off limits it's uh you know it's okay to have but, but it still has to be restrictive in the sense of like there has to be a, a restricted quantity that would be acceptable sure um yeah and even though they want to get away from food rules and what amount you sh you should eat um listening to your body sometimes you're saying initially means i i have to get to a space first where i don't have all of the high risk binge foods in my home where you're saying there may be a space there that's really important for you. Um, and my uh, dietitian friend who I've consulted with and some of the readings do support that, that if currently, if there are any foods like in your home that are really high risk for binging on, um, for some people, it is important to do stimulus control initially uh, with removing it from the home. Um, but what they want to do for people is then to actually get to a space of like, if I'm really, really, really wanting it and I'm craving it, allow myself to have it, like go there. And there's there's other decision-making options that I'm gonna walk through with you today, um, but it's gonna get to a space of like, if I'm really craving pizza, I'm really craving that pasta, if I allow myself to have it every time I want it, initially you may, that's all that you want for the first week or two, but it's really trusting the wisdom of the body that naturally we want three things. Um, and this is not for bulimia or anorexia, but with binge eating, they see effectively naturally when you no longer tell yourself, don't have that, don't go there and just let yourself eat it. Your body will naturally eventually want balance, moderation, and variety because what they found is even if that person really loved pizza and they let themselves have it for two weeks, they don't want it anymore. Like their bodies naturally then wanted uh, maybe something to balance it out, like, like a, a fruit or maybe something else um, that had higher fiber, um, but it was actually letting themselves get to a space of no longer restricting and allowing themselves, if I'm really craving it, not eating, all the things to try to satisfy that hunger or that craving that's not the actual item because then you're actually much more likely to let's say you really want that pizza and you have a handful of walnuts it still isn't satisfying so you eat a yogurt it's still not satisfying you'll eat a bag of chips and it's not satisfying and ultimately you end up overeating and wanting that thing that you wanted in the first place and so what they see in the mindset of mindful eating is if you allow yourself to every time you crave it maybe it shouldn't be in the home initially because it's a high risk binge food um, but i will then go out and allow myself to get that sweets or i will then allow myself to go out and get some pizza um, and then really listen to my body as i'm eating it too because if i'm choosing i go ahead and move forward with it there's a mindful eating process where i could really slow down I could really enjoy it and listen to my body of how is it feeling as I'm eating this. And there's other things like having a speed bump along the way to just tune in and to check in with your body. Um, and then eventually that process where they see like the first couple of weeks, you may end up feeling like, oh, I'm just allowing myself to eat this. And then I'm going to be down this um, like slippery slope right, of constantly eating the sugars or something else. Um, but ultimately for all of their binge eaters, they see like the body gets tired of it. Whatever it is that you felt so addicted to, if you no longer restricted it, your body no longer feels so deprived of it that it wants it all the time. And then eventually if you let yourself eat it every time you're really, really craving it, um, eventually it's gonna want moderation and balance with other things and variety. Our, our bodies also really enjoy variety and eating variety. Um, I really like Natalie's point here on the benefits though, because I, what I'm hearing you say is, I have to restrict sugar. I have to control it like maybe just one 
somehow reintroduce it. Right now, it sounds like sugar feels really dangerous and unsafe for you because what I'm hearing is, is the value underneath that, like I value taking care of my health. I value being in a space where this food doesn't take control of my life or dominates it, right? And then if I eliminate sugar, I don't want it because I don't want to get to that space where I continue to binge or something like that. Does do those benefits seem to resonate with you, Urban? Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I think so. Um, did you have any other thoughts as well as to what I was expressing surrounding um, the uh, mindful eating I mean, process? There are, there is, yeah, I mean, there's resonance for sure with, with those things. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I think in terms of like, you know, or, or really, it's for me, it's understandable in terms of like smoking. Uh, because I, I used to smoke for a number of like a long right. time uh, and I've quit for I don't know, like over, over three years um, mm -hmm. but I but I still use nicotine replacement mm -hmm. so even though I, I've restricted like I don't I don't ever sit, have a cigarette because mm -hmm. I know that for me it's like alcohol mm -hmm. like, alcoholic. like that's, that's how smoking is for me I mean if mm -hmm. I have one it's a thousand, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, so, um, right. but at the same time, in order for me to do it, I had to, I had to use nicotine replacement to be able to get off the cigarettes. And I'm very right. happy with uh, where I'm at, even though, I mean, and right now I'm working on trying to reduce the, the nicotine, but what you're saying kind of makes sense to me that, you know, like, that that might not be that might not be the way to go, um, because that might lead back to the smoking, which is more important to me to not do than the mm -hmm. uh, getting off the nicotine part. Yeah, and you're saying the aspects that feel similar to quitting nicotine. I mean, quitting smoking is having something in place right. of it. Restricting, you know, like the restricting sugar might be like the 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 cigarette mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you know some form of you know like some some type of sugar or or some instances of, of you know like i mean I, I don't think you can eliminate sugar completely from your diet it's or at least not my diet because it's it's not even possible with oh yeah the things that you you know you buy a jar of sauce or something and put it in you know whatever it, it's uh it's it's gonna have sugar in it somewhere mm -hmm. what what is your fear about sugar and how does limiting it benefit you uh well i i i think sugar is like is like the smoke is like the smoking for me mm. like it's 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 the it's it's what it's what creates those um urges for from like to have more i mean i don't i don't like eat a carrot and go oh, i think i want to have more carrots you know what i mean but i might i might I, I i could have something you know sugary chocolatey and go yeah i could have more of that mm -hmm. and i don't have the i don't feel as though i have the control to just limit that mm -hmm. just like i don't have the control to just have one cigarette like mm -hmm. something you know go have you know one cigarette a week or something and that's mm -hmm. i could never do that it's, it's uh you know i've tried that but <laughs> like for me it was like none or a thousand right it's yeah and what is your fear around sugar if you did allow yourself to eat sugar when you wanted to and when your body was really wanting some sugar what what is the fear is it surrounding health is it surrounding weight gain uh, yeah, well, it's definitely weight gain, but I mean, a, a, and that that it's, I mean, it's not necessary. It's it's weight gain uh, that I I don't feel like I can stop when it comes to sugar. Yeah, so that sense of control feels really important. Um, and then the value is also, you said partially your health, but partially not gaining weight. Yeah. And I know, like, I, I'm not the kind of person that's going to like, eliminate sugar and replace it with, you know, I don't know, so-called like healthy snacks. Mm -hmm. And do I remember right surrounding gaining weight? Eating these healthy snacks, but they're not satisfying. So you go back to the, you know, another snack that's 
healthy, but it's not satisfying. So you're still overeating. So you're I, saying you're saying you're one that relates to that or that wouldn't do that. Yeah, 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 you relate to that. For sure. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so you relate to the pattern that they're talking about of yeah. um if I really want this thing and I tell myself I can't have it, I'll eat around it. <laughs> And I'll eat all sorts of things until I get that thing that's more satisfying for me. Right? And so it's actually better to let myself have that. Yeah, and I think for me that it, even the sugar itself is not satisfying. Yeah, that's when we're talking about deeper needs too. Right? It's, it's the, uh, it, it, I mean, it's better than it's better than all the other stuff, but it's, mm -hmm. it, it does have some benefits, right? But it's not. Uh, they're they're not good benefits really yeah and if you were in control of your sugar intake um, where you're restricting it when you said then i won't gain weight and i remember you saying like the weight gain was also surrounding like valuing like social connections and being physically appealing to the opposite sex right. is that a value underneath continuing to restrict is then i can um more likely improve my chances of having a partner or finding that connection uh yeah, well i mean yeah probably ultimately and in terms of the you know, losing weight component mm -hmm. so does that feel true for you valuing connection improving my chances of when i'm dating or something like yeah, that sure. yeah. yeah is that important to you i i think so yeah and so it makes sense, like I'm restricting, I'm telling myself I can't have sugar. Um, <clears throat> and there's a lot of good reasons to that. So even though I've seen that that has led me to eat around that sugar treat that I've wanted, um, it does get to a space where this is my sense of control. This is my way of taking care of my health. Um, sugar to me has been like that smoking where I know I just can't have one. And so it's also like, I'm realistic about that, right? And I really don't wanna gain any more weight because if I just allow myself to eat sugar when I want it, am I hearing from you like there's a fear that you'd be out of control? Uh, yeah, I don't, know. I don't know if fear is the right word, but I mean, I, I definitely. I mean, what would be the right word, like anxiety or nervousness uh, that you'd be out of control? Just knowing that I would be out of control, you know, like, I mean, I, I don't think it's, it's a matter of being afraid that I would be out of control. I think I just would be out of control. That it would be out of control. And is it in your mind, like indefinitely, if I don't restrict the I mean, sugar? It's, it's been a, it's been that way for a long time. So I, I can't <laughs> see. You know, I mean, it's not that I'm afraid that I'm going to get out of control. I just already know that it's something that is, I can't control. It's something that has been out of control for you. Or yeah. at least at this moment. Right. Yeah. At some point, but at this moment, it's not something I can control. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So would that be a cost of change? is if you were to go to a space of mindful eating where you ultimately let yourself have foods that you're really, really craving, is that uh, I could get to a space uh, where yeah, definitely. I'd be out of control indefinitely. Yeah. Yeah. Sugar for sure. Being out of control with sugar indefinitely. Yeah, and a lot of this, um, they also talk about like, we'll need exposure therapy, right? Because we would then need to really have the client expose themselves to this belief that um, if I do allow myself to engage in mindful eating with sugar or pizza or pasta, um, there's lots of different uh, fear foods um, for a lot of people that if I then let myself have it, I will be out of control. It has been out of control. And so, um, we'd have to do a lot of exposure therapy with it on um, what would it be like if we just tested that out for a week um, where you do let yourself um, eat that pasta when you want it, have the ingredients available so you can make it when your body's really wanting it um, and not eating around the food that your body's really craving too, that you just go straight towards that bag of chips if that's what you want 
instead of trying to eat all of the healthy foods. Because satisfaction is not just about fullness. It's actually sometimes really wanting that crunch or sometimes really wanting that savory flavor um, and no longer villainizing that bag of chips, for example. Um, okay, so let me see if there's something in the chat real quick before I rate your motivation to change. Um, are there any other uh, cost of change that you see, Urban, that we haven't mentioned? And then I'll read the chat while you're looking at that. No, I, th I think that's, 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 that's what all that I can think of at the moment. Okay, great. Okay, um, and Justin had a comment here. Okay, so now he's wondering, wondering um, is it like alcohol addiction? Some people just really need to stay away from it. And so maybe mindful eating doesn't work for everyone. They need to actually stay away from the chocolate bars or the cake. Um, what they're seeing in their research is that um, food and that I'm noticing too, because I've seen Team CBT tools to be really effective with clients who've struggled with drinking, smoking, kind of all of the substances, um, even process addictions. I've done um, shopping addiction and seen it to be really effective. Those things that our bodies don't have a relationship that we need it to survive like we do with food, it seems like the, the abstinence approach um, can be really powerful and effective for, for those specific addictions. Like, like gambling, sex addiction, whatever else. When it comes to food, it seems like it's a lot more than um, restricting and abstinence that it's actually really important to ultimately get to a space of changing your relationship with food. So we don't wanna get to a space where it's like, I'm not gonna villainize meth or cocaine. I can have a little bit of it sometimes. That's, that's really not our approach with a lot of those really highly addictive substances, right? But with food, um, they've seen that overall, that this is actually the key of no longer restricting. Because again, those who actually end up restricting or went on another diet were the ones who are more likely to binge. So it's actually changing up our relationship with food instead of the abstinence approach with it, like we may use with other things like alcohol and um, gambling and shopping and things like that. Um, and just like you're saying, it is true. An, an approach may not be for everyone. I don't think anything is completely effective. Even Team CBT, I think, is the most powerful approach for anxiety and depression. Works for about 80 to 90% of people. And I think mindful eating has even better stats than that for binge eating. Um, but of course, it isn't for every single person. Justin says, this resonates with my journey of managing hormonal issues through drastic dietary changes that seem near impossible and evoked a lot of shame. I didn't follow it exactly to a T, okay. Um, things started to change when I gave into certain urges and accepted the inevitability of allowance. I needed my nightly two to three bowls of fruity pebbles at first, yeah. But things started to change when I began Bikram yoga and worked on raising my self-awareness of my energy level and that my body was telling me. Oh, that's really interesting, Justin. So am I hearing like it also had a similar approach of no longer fighting urges, but really tuning in, listening, allowing myself, um, whether it's the fruity pebbles or something else, and then also incorporating like a healthy movement for you. Um, I haven't heard of Bikram yoga. I may be butchering that. Um, but am I hearing from you? It's kind of the same process of going from uh, restricting or fighting urges to allowance that really helped you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and just trying to kind of, you know, like Urban was saying, kind of work through some of that shame. Um, you know, I, I was looking into doing a lot of research on different foods like broccoli, for example, that would help, you know, raise the natural levels of testosterone in your body. And so I would try to go home and like eat this humongous bowl of broccoli and I was like, my body would be craving other things. And like, like you mentioned, you know, you end up 
inevitably having the thing that you ultimately want and you're trying so hard to Mm -hmm. keep yourself from. And so when I started to give myself that allowance, but, you know, the exercising and the physical activity was a big piece. So I'd, you know, I'd burn like a thousand calories when I'd work out and then I'd be sitting here, you know, counting my calories. I'm like, I had 1200 calories worth of fruity pebbles tonight. So, you know, kind of working through that and then waking up in the morning and feeling your energy level and you're like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm ready for a change. And I think some of those thoughts you have is, you know, what your body's signaling to you, like, hey, you know, we want this change. Something needs to happen. Um, but allowing yourself the grace that, you know, it takes time. Um, oh, and, you know, sure. it takes kind of nurturing that. Um, yeah. So that's, you know, I'm, that's still my journey. I'm not perfect with that, uh, but that's okay. You know, I've learned to kind of listen to my body a little mm. bit better and it's, yeah. it's caused a lot of uh, beneficial changes uh, to my lifestyle. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing um, your personal journey through that. And I love your point of uh, giving yourself grace. It takes time uh, working through the shame and for urban, it wasn't so much around the eating, but the body image sounds like an important piece. Um, But they uh, also really agree with you on really listening to the body's wisdom, because a lot of times when we're actually uh, feeling out of control and eating, it's actually not listening to our body and what what it's needing or wanting, because afterwards, your body will actually tell you this doesn't feel good. This isn't what I want. And so if we were to actually tune in more with the body's wisdom, ultimately, it does actually moves us towards balance, variety, and moderation with everything. Um, if we no longer tell ourselves, don't do that, don't go there, don't eat those fruity pebbles, um, then, then it will give you balance surrounding that, right? Okay, let me answer a couple more questions and then we'll move forward. Um, Debbie asks, what about logging what you eat so that you are aware um, I've read a couple of resources on this. Um, with mindful eating from Dr. May, they don't like food diaries. They want life to get to a space where you're listening to your body, you eat when you're hungry, um, and then you move on with life. And food diaries make you really be fixated on food, and it's almost a form of still trying to control using something external to control your eating habits versus just really tuning in and listening to yourself. Um, So they actually don't advocate for for food diaries and and logging your food. I think it it, it contributes to the restrictiveness of things because the reason that you're doing it is to eliminate certain foods. And and there is no, I mean, I've I've done food journals where I record all the things that I eat, whatever, but it, it really didn't affect my ability to lose weight because it didn't address mm-hmm. the quantity. It just addressed the quality of what you were eating. Right. But I mean, you can eat, I mean, you can eat 500 calories a day of cake and lose weight. If that's all you're eating is 500 calories a day, you're going to lose weight. It doesn't matter mm-hmm. what. You eat. Oh yeah, absolutely. It, quantity not so much not so much the quality i mean maybe some things are probably more nutritious and helpful to the body i'm sure i uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but the fact is it doesn't really matter what it is that you eat it's how much how much you eat and that's where a bit of my struggle is is with that yeah and with mindful eating they want people to get away from external measures to tell you what to eat and when to eat and actually really listening to when I'm hungry and what is it that my body's wanting, that sounds really good. And uh, that also means getting away from like a point system, like Weight Watchers, getting away from um, the scale, like where that number determines what you eat, you're more likely to restrict. Um, The other resource that I've read and really liked, the eight keys that was recommended by Dr. Lorraine Wong. She's one of our eating disorder experts in Team CBT. it talks about completely getting rid of weighing themselves for the rest of their lives because that number always triggers people to either um, restrict or purge um, and then ultimately binge in the middle of that process. And again, I'm using that number to control what I eat and when I eat. And that again, removes our satisfaction from this process and uh, disconnects us from really listening to our bodies. Um, and so that's why they don't advocate for uh, Weight Watchers or um, weighing yourself or any kind of diet system that tells you like, oh, don't eat after seven 
don't even have a grape after 8 p.m. because it's actually just, if you're really hungry by 11, eat whatever sounds really good to you, right? Okay, um, that is cool though, Debbie, that your husband had lost weight on that. 120 pounds, that's impressive. Um, yeah, but was allowed to eat anything he wanted, felt like logging was helpful. And so again, I think like with team methods that work great for others, um, that don't work for some may work for others. So I think it's about trying different things too. Okay. So let's move forward, Urban. Um, we've already done voicing the resistance, but I'm wondering if there's any of these pieces because we haven't done it with the restricting, if that would feel helpful for you or if um, going through some of the other tools may be helpful because this is still part of that motivation part. Yeah, I think we can go to the to other tools. If we, yeah. Okay, where is your motivation um, zero to 100, seeing all of these powerful benefits of continuing to binge, continuing to restrict, which they see ultimately may lead to a binge um, if we continue to restrict indefinitely. And you're talking about maybe initially, but I, you'd like to change to more mindful eating. Um, and then the cost of change is um, just work and probably exposure therapy. Like, uh, do I really get out of control if I give myself this new process of relating with food? Um, zero to 100, where's your motivation to continue to change your eating? Oh, to continue to change my eating? Yeah, for, uh, yeah. It, uh, yeah like, uh, yeah, still on the like, you know, 95 to 100 percent. Okay, considering that the binging is your form of escape and pleasure in life, you're, you're ready to let go of that. Uh, yeah, I think so. And even when like, it's the thing that helps you to relax and have some me time, you'd have to find something that's not as appealing initially to do. Yeah, I mean, you want to do that. The only thing that's sort of hanging in there for me is, is the thought that um, That, that, I, I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's like the enjoyment or something of <laughs> of life. That's you know, like yeah. Um, that, you know, like I mean, the, yeah. Like, you can go to sleep. You can get. Yeah, I mean, you could. Uh, you know, you could. Uh, <laughs> like I, I mean, I work. I work. Let's say twelve hours a day. Uh, you know, I. I maybe have, you know, two, maybe three hours before I need to like go to sleep so that I can do another shift the next day. Uh, you know, and part of that involves, you know, showering, changing my clothes, whatever, uh, you know, spending time with my kids. Uh, you know, it's kind of like, okay, what else is there? that it makes it you know like gives me some joy uh in those you know three hours that i have for myself or less than that probably two hours of time that i have for myself before i have to go to bed and do it all over again tomorrow yeah you get a lot of enjoyment from having this moment of me time and eating the chocolates and and you're saying the binging is a form of enjoyment when I'm actually having a break from a long day of work, 12 hours, and I don't wanna just go straight to sleep. Um, so why would you want to change? Considering it is such a powerful source of enjoyment and a, a powerful break for you. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, I mean, I think, I think probably the other things of that, you know, um, I, I'm, I would feel better about myself, uh, lose the weight, uh, that would that would probably translate at least for me which would I feel it would translate to you know improving my chances when I'm dating 
I, I would probably have more uh, acceptance of myself, uh, body, body image wise. Yeah. Um, and then there's a space here too with the restricting um, where uh, with mindful eating, we do let go of the focus of losing weight, just letting go of that number. But they do see that people who effectively engage in mindful eating do actually fall to a, a set point weight, right? And many of them, it's losing um, a lot of weight. Um, and at the same time, we won't be focusing on the weight loss. We'd just be focusing on changing your relationship with food. And some of that would include no longer restricting any food. And that includes like, hey, if I'm really, really wanting this, I may go get some at uh, you know a certain amount and then eat and listen to my body and really enjoy it. Um, but it would mean I no longer restrict sugar. I get to the space. And initially it may feel really scary to do that considering it has felt out of control in your life. Why would you wanna try this different approach of also letting go of restricting, which we see to be effective for treating the binging? Letting go of restricting and moving towards mindful eating. Yeah, I, I, I think it can be kind of like, a, you know, like how, how am I gonna do this? Like, I don't think I can do this, uh, but, yeah. I've done it with other things, so there's some experience to maybe try to draw upon to help support myself to get through this. And like, you know, it's like again with like the smoking. I don't, I don't every day think about like, oh, I would, I want to have a smoke. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like this, there's, you know, there's days now. I mean, initially, definitely like the first couple of months, that was like on my mind every probably like it felt like almost all the time mm -hmm. um, whereas now there's definitely times Sorry. when i don't think about it at all uh, uh, so you know maybe it would be it will be the same thing with uh with food that initially it will it will be that way it will be on my mind but it will get to a mm -hmm. point where it will be like smoking that it's not you know something that you think about every day so it, you know there's a little yeah. bit of Yeah. And so it's going to be kind of scary at first. It's trying something new. You're saying, I don't know how I'll do it. And they do really encourage support through this process, like through uh, one of their the programs. I know there's a couple in Canada um, that I've looked up on there. Um, and at the very least, their workbook, I was looking up, but uh, my internet's not working um, over here. I mean, my browsers, there's something messed up there, but at least going through the workbook, which is like $19, um, where there's just solid exercises that will be structured that can walk you through the process. Um, because initially, I think this is like fighting a force of nature, right? And it's shifting how we've been relating with food. And we all need support in that process. I don't think it's a, a quick journey, an easy journey. Um, but it really sounds like they've gotten down a program with step-by-step -step processes that can really work for it. So what I'm hearing from you is um, you're feeling kind of unsure. You're saying, I, I don't know how I'll do that. Um, but you said, I've done it with other things and I can draw on my experience to help me. And um, possibly I can get to the space where I don't have to think of it or, or need it every day, just like with cigarettes or someone else letting go of drinking or something like that, right? Yeah, why would you want to try no longer restricting sugar considering it could get out of control? I mean, continue, you said, I have a knowing that it gets out of control. Um, and what they're saying that's I think is really counterintuitive is that I let go of trying to control those foods. And I actually then instead of, telling myself, don't have it, don't go there. I go into the decision-making process, which I'll walk through with you as, as soon as we finish this. Um, but why would you want to stop that restricting behavior considering you know it has gotten you out of control when you ate sugar? Uh, well, I mean, I think ultimately, I mean, you have to, I mean, I think it's important to know those things so that, 
you can live with it. Like, I mean, there's, I, I don't, like I say, I don't think that you can totally eliminate like all sugar. <laughs> it's just not possible. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's hidden sugar, sugar is hidden in virtually everything that we eat. I mean, other than you know, maybe a vegetable or something, but um, so it's, it's, you know, picking, I, I think having some sugar is probably going to be okay. But I have to get to that point where it's it's uh, having some of it is going to be okay. And right now it mm -hmm. feels like having none of it is the only way to get to that point. Yeah, and I'm asking you, why would you want to be at a space where you no longer have rules around sugar? Considering it has been at a space where it's been kind of scary or out of control. Because the key of this is actually getting to the space of letting go of restricting. I no longer have rules around sugar. I no longer tell myself I only need to eat one or I only need to eat foods that aren't sweet. Um, I actually just ultimately get to the space that I have no food rules, no food are forbidden, but I'm going to walk through this other step process that I'll show you on decide on the options instead. Um. Why would you want to try something different that sounds so counterintuitive like that? Pretty hard to do that. Um, yeah. Uh, but I mean, I, I'm willing. I mean, I, I mean, I guess I've, I've, I've tried everything else. So why, I, like, why not, right? Mm. Yeah. I mean, I mean, maybe it will work. I, I, it, uh... Yeah. So you're saying. Um, maybe it's worth a shot because I've tried everything else. So why not? And maybe this is the thing that could work. Possibly. Um, how has it affected you to continue to restrict and to diet or to, to tell yourself to cut down or not, not go there? Uh, Well, I mean, the, the, well, obviously that, 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 that after I've done that or after I've stopped the restricting, then the, 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 the weight has come back. So. Mm -hmm. So you've seen that restricting leads me to kind of yo-yo on the weight loss and weight gain. Right. Sure. And um, I would probably add that on here as well. Restricting once I stop. All the weight comes back. Yeah, or, yeah. I mean, a lot of it. <laughs> a lot of the weight comes back. Yeah. Am I hearing then it hasn't quite worked in the way that you've wanted it to? Right. I mean, I mean, it's worked at the time when I was yeah. not like after. It hasn't worked in the long run. Or consistently. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm just trying to, as you all know, uh, and those of you who are new to Team CBT, what we're doing is we're looking at what are all of the good reasons why this person has continued to engage in a certain behavior, and the triple paradox is paradoxical because it wants to align with the part of them that has continued to binge, continue to restrict or drink or shop or anything else. And there's also some real cost of change. So what I'm doing with Urban is I wanna make sure that he's the person that takes on the voice that's convincing me that he'd like to try this new treatment approach on how he approaches food. And so I wanna make sure that he does wanna stop binging, which seems clear. It sounds like there may be ambivalence with stopping the restricting, which I think we can work with considering it'll probably just need exposure therapy. Um, but ultimately, he's stating that, um, well, with restricting in the past, once I stop, a lot of the weight comes back. I've tried everything else already, so why not try mindful eating or this new treatment approach? And um, ultimately, restricting hasn't worked for him in the long run consistently. He says it worked for me during the restriction. Um, but I also heard him say things like, when I'm restricting, I'm feeling kind of resentful. It feels unfair. Um, his mind is consumed with food. Uh, if I was working with the client, I may assess if all, those are also the costs that may feel true with continuing it. Um, and then once he 
shares with me why he wants to move forward with this new approach and he's convincing me that he wants to do the work, I want to then re-rate the motivation. Uh, Urban's motivation last time was actually 75 after we did the triple paradox. So it sounds like the motivation's higher even now. Um, and I'm wondering for you, Urban, when we're looking at the benefits of restricting, which is the new thing that we did today, and the cost of possibly being out of control if, or needing to do exposure therapy, if I just allow myself this new mindful eating process, where is your motivation overall um, when you're looking at like starting this new process, letting go of restricting, going towards mindful eating? Well, I, I, yeah, I think it's, it's, I mean, the ambivalence definitely is there. Uh, mm -hmm, of course. <laughs> so, I, I mean, it's trying to like convince myself that this is like possible or that it's going to, mm -hmm. uh, that it's sustainable, I guess. Uh, so, you know, zero to a hundred. I mean, ultimately, I want I, you know I want I want to be able to do this. So, mm -hmm. uh, like eighty percent, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, am I hearing one of the costs of change is I could risk disappointment? I'm right now kind of ambivalent and hesitant to maybe try one more thing because I've tried everything already. Uh, Would that be a true cost? Yeah, it might be. It might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could risk disappointment. I've tried everything else and now I'm trying one more thing. And what if it doesn't work? That would feel kind of discouraging, right? Sorry. Disappointing. Yeah. Um, and so when we're looking at that, um, and you could possibly get disappointed. Um, this is trying something new. It feels counterintuitive to no longer restrict. That's where we want to get you to. Like you're no longer restricting sugar or telling yourself I can't eat sugar um, and slowly actually introducing it with mindful eating and listening to your body on what feels good, what doesn't feel good. Um, you said then that uh, you're willing to still try something new despite the ambivalence. Yeah. And that your motivation overall is still at 80%, despite you could risk disappointment there. Right. Any other reasons why you want to move forward when you could risk disappointment and risk trying one more thing that doesn't work, that would feel so discouraging? I, I, I mean, I, I, I feel sort of confident that um, with enough knowledge about like with gaining knowledge about how the mindfulness would work, mm -hmm. that, that would maybe, that, that would probably increase my um, feeling that it will be successful. Mm -hmm. okay. So you're saying the more I learn about mindful eating, yeah. um, there's an increased hope that it could work. I think so, yeah. It could be successful, you said. Okay, yeah. Um, well, like, any changes in your motivation as you added that statement? Uh, no, I think that's why like motivation is probably like 80%. Okay, like, it's not, great. It's not 100 because I just don't feel totally like confident that I yeah. fully understand how the mindfulness. Oh, of course, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like if this was my client and I do plan on actually taking the full course, um, it would be like a system and a process where you're walking through with somebody who's been trained in it, who could guide you. Um, just like with anything else, I think that additional support is so key um, in this process. And I know in this process, this is just us demonstrating the tools. So your hesitation is, I think, um, your hesitation or like, um, you know, a questioning like, can I actually do this? Makes perfect sense considering like you're totally not expected to, to do this alone. And that's why they even created the workbook to walk people step-by-step step through the journey as well. Um, okay, so as motivation's 80, typically I wanna see at least 70 still after talking through the challenges and everything before we move forward. 
Um, so just going through some of the processes with some of the tools that I've read through their book and through the eight keys of recovery from an eating disorder. Um, the first piece often seems to be like, let's just pause and get some awareness around the whys. So I really like, um, we've already done some of the awareness journal here. So if you saw the last webinar, we've around the why, what we have a person do is in the moment when you're really tempted to binge, let's just pause, that you'd agree to just pause. You could go ahead and binge right afterwards, um, but let's just pause and understand what's going on. Like right now, what are my triggers? And so it's the evening, it's after work, my kids are doing their own thing. So Urban's daughters are busy. And so he's feeling exhausted, stressed, inadequate, lonely. And so it's just connecting with those feelings, just like Kate was typing into the um, chat that um, she was saying, for some people, the trauma, the food is in place of love. And they also see that, like this food is maybe meeting a deeper need for them, whether it's giving me a sense of connection, it's filling me up in some way. Um, it's my relationship that, that I'm missing that's not there. Um, and for others, it's their way of like numbing out anger because they're actually really angry at their husband. And that's why I've introduced the hidden emotion as a tool that could be really effective. Because in the book, there was a story with a woman who was resentful towards her husband for not helping out at home as much. So she would binge as a way to stuff her anger. Um, for others, it was like about their sex life. They weren't satisfied. So they would binge to stuff their anger or disconnect. And the resolution was actually going to the space of like, what is my need and my action plan? So my need is actually connection, physical connection, appreciation, being appreciated by another person. And uh, Urban said beyond that, even just physical touch and affection, we all need that. And food is something very tangible and physical that fills us up. And maybe it's actually going to the action plan of, I no longer want to put my life on hold or hold off on dating until I'm a certain size that I will actually move forward with that. Like I could take a class. I could join a meeting where I meet new people. I could find some singles activities where I could meet other single people. And it's doing things that are actionable that can ultimately stop the binge eating for people. So the first piece is just the awareness journal, which we've done with Urban last time. Um, but I'd like to walk through, um, this piece of just an awareness for you, Urban, where this is in integrating mindfulness, the moment right before I'm about to binge, if I'm willing to just pause and tune in, like truly take, take a breath, like the, the most effective breath is a deep inhale through the nose, slow exhale through the mouth. And they see it's the pursing of the lips and the slow exhale that's actually the relaxing component. And if we could just stop the behavior at that moment, um, even do the breath with the client, they're more likely to get in tune and begin to shift that pattern that automatically mindlessly goes into that space of almost like trance-like uh, mindless eating, right? So then you're connecting with what am I thinking right now? What is really going on? What is my body wanting? Is it wanting food or is it actually thirsty? Or is it actually just tired and it needs something energizing like going for a walk? because um, sometimes we're wanting that food to give ourselves that energy boost. Um, and then we actually may go for a walk and realize I didn't need that food. And sometimes it's needing my body's wanting touch and connection with another human being, right? And what's in my heart, what am I feeling? And so they say, if you could begin to have this awareness journal where you just do this mind, body, heart scan, where you just take a breath, pause before it, you're not telling yourself, don't eat because the more you tell yourself that, the more you will want to do that. But it's just tuning in and really listening to ourselves first. That's the first step that begins to change things. And so I'm wondering if we could uh, quickly walk through that and then go through decide the options, um, Urban. So yeah. let's go to that moment um, and visualize that moment in time you're, you just got off of a 12 hour long day and you're exhausted and you're tired and it feels really good to think about even beginning the binging process and watching a show and winding down your kids are doing their own thing and let's just imagine that you're there 
and see yourself. Let's just take a breath together. Deep inhale, slow exhale. And you could even literally just step away from that food trigger, whether it's that pantry or wherever it's at and visualize yourself doing that. And let's just connect with what you're thinking, what your body's wanting and what your heart is feeling. If we were in that moment, what are likely the thoughts going on for you? Um, <clears throat> like after I've had the taken my breath. Yeah, you're at that moment when you're feeling really triggered. And we're just visualizing you've stepped away from the food trigger and you just take a breath. And what is going on in your mind? What, what is your body wanting? And then what are you feeling in that moment? Yeah, it's, I'm probably in my mind, I'm thinking, uh, I, don't really, I don't really need this. You're thinking, I don't really need this? A snack, like. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I don't, I don't need a, you know, uh, sweet or whatever it is. Um, okay. Like, you know, I can, I can, I can hold off. I don't, I don't really need this. I can hold off. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, or maybe the, the, I definitely probably the thoughts were, like I need some, I need some energy right now, and this will give me energy. Because mm -hmm. you were saying you're tired, right? So step, stepping away from it would definitely, uh, I think, help with um, assessing that. Like you know, yeah. Whether, you know, <laughs> and I, I just need, uh, you know, like obviously, uh, if I feel like I need some energy, is there something else that I can do that could give me? Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I don't really need this. What I need is some energy. And um, what I'm feeling is like I'm feeling tired, exhausted, um, kind of disconnected because my kids are kind of doing their own thing, right? And then what is your body wanting? And so you're just imagining you're in that moment and then really connecting with what, what is my body wanting? Sometimes it may actually want the food. And that's when that's why when you decide your options eat anyway is always a legitimate option. You never go to that space again of like, don't do that, don't go there, it's bad for you, which I think we've typically done with the devil's advocate, where it's like, no, you don't need that right now, it's bad for you, it's you know, it's gonna poison your system or something like that. Um, for them, it's actually eat anyway is always a legitimate option if that's what your body really wants there. And it doesn't have to be a need. We don't have to distinguish between my body, does my body need this? If my body really, really wants it, it's a legitimate option for me to eat it because our bodies probably don't need a lot of the variety of different things that we, we eat, right? But it does need food to sustain and no, with mindful eating, no food is forbidden and no food is bad for you any longer. Um, what is your body wanting? What, what are the possible options? So sometimes it's actually wanting to eat, right? Yeah, it might be, yeah. It yeah, be. sometimes it wants to eat. And what else could it be wanting? Uh, like yeah, probably, probably that sort of, uh, uh, you know, rest. <laughs> you rest, yeah, because it's exhausted, right? Um, but you're saying it needs some energy too. And so sometimes I can get it through food. Is there any other ways that you get energy other than rest? Is that like um, just relaxation or sleep or movement? <clears throat> yeah, I don't, yeah, I mean, I don't even, what does my body want? I don't know. Mm. Would touch be one? Maybe, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Where sometimes like I'm needing energy and sometimes it's actually the touch and socialization. Socialization, Like if I'm, I know you really enjoy dancing, um, but it could be like, you know, I uh, 
go go out with somebody or go hang out with a friend and that gives me energy and connection right um, and the touch hugging another person holding another person even a handshake and things like that could be the things that my body is wanting um, and that's why we go to this process here of being mindful so if i'm gonna choose to eat anyway so now you know what you're thinking i don't really need this i need some energy um, and it's better to do this in the moment. I'm just walking you through that as a visualization right now. But in the moment, you're getting aware. My body's, what is it needing? Sometimes it's needing to eat. Um, but there are times when it needs rest. There are times when it needs touch or that's what it's wanting. And what I'm feeling is tired, exhausted, disconnected. Um, so when you want to eat anyway, you want to eat mindfully. Um, and you really want to listen to your body. And that means eating to the space of the intention that I set from the beginning is I want to feel better after I eat and not worse, like physically. Um, and likely probably emotionally too, if you're physically feeling better, right? Um, but if you eat anyway, eat mindfully. And that means um, eat what you're wanting, what you're wanting, um, but enjoy it. Uh, take your time to savor it. Um, listen to your body if it's having too much of it. So it's like the third candy bar and it's feeling like just continue to tune in to see is this still satisfying for my body or is it starting to feel kind of queasy or like it's too much. Right. Um, and there's a lot of other aspects with that too, but my intention is to feel better. Um, and they also tell you after I eat, whether I feel more energized, I feel more satisfied. And then they also say set an intention with where you want to be on the hunger and fullness scale. So you're saying mine is not as sensitive right now where I could say, oh, this is where I'm satisfied and this is overly full. But you do know when it's really uncomfortable. And so we want to set an intention to where it's around a five or a six where I feel satisfied and comfortable and not to the point of uncomfortable when I'm, I'm too full, right? Um, okay, and then, so you're at this segue, you connected with your mind and your body and what it's wanting. Um, you could also have done some of the trigger feelings need an action plan. And from here, we want to get to the space from I'm not allowed. That's the restrictive thinking, right? I'm not allowed, I shouldn't, I can't, this is bad, this food will kill me to the space of I get to decide. And so this is really so much more of like harm reduction than it is abstinence. So sometimes I may decide to eat anyway. We don't want this mindset with like meth or heroin or something like that. But with eating, this is a totally legitimate process that sometimes I allow myself to eat anyway. And when I choose to eat, I'll eat mindfully and then I'll be in touch with, with that process and it's satisfying. Um, sometimes I may need to choose to redirect my focus. And then other times I may need to actually address my true needs. And what they find is if I always eat anyway, or I only redirect my focus and I don't address my true needs, likely the binging will continue. <clears throat> because sometimes my true needs, um, the binging is a way that my body has a voice about something's not being met, whether I'm not satisfied in my marriage or I'm lonely or I'm angry with someone that I'm not having a voice about. I think there's pieces of the hidden emotion treatment model for this, um, but what they say, let me try to make sure I remember this analogy correctly, is they say, we have two buckets. Uh, one is your hunger bucket and one is your needs bucket. And you have all of these needs but you continue to try to use food to meet your needs, but it just fills up your hunger bucket until it's overly full. And then your needs bucket will continue to stay empty. And if that bucket continues to stay empty, the binge eating is likely to continue. And so you don't always have to address your true needs. Redirecting your focus really helps shift the binging behaviors. Eating anyway, instead of restricting, going to the I'm not allowed helps as well. Um, when you eat it mindfully. Um, but addressing your true needs is actually a really crucial ingredient um, to getting to a space of stopping binge eating. And they found that for 
um, people who needed to work through trauma, um, express anger towards loved ones or express like something that's really been on their minds that they've stuffed. Um, for some people, it was uh, sexual needs that weren't being met or just really feeling disconnected with their partners. So the binge almost filled that space. And so addressing their true needs, whether it's their marriage or a relationship, um, so healing from some past trauma, expressing anger was a really important part there too. So what are some things that are effective um, for you, Urban? I had sent that um, 101 ways, 101 things to do other than eating. Um, and I think that's a really great list of things you can do to redirect your focus there. And there's things for self-care, there's things for connection, there's things for creativity. Um, <clears throat> were there things that connected with you, Urban? I don't remember that document. When you redirect your focus, you don't remember the 101 things to do other than eating? Let me see if I can pull it up. No, I don't remember. And maybe you could just think of some things now. Uh, well, I mean, other things to do. I mean, yeah, I think. Like I mean, in that moment. Yeah. If you, if you tuned in and then you realize like, oh, my body's not really wanting this and I'm I, not I, hungry. I the idea of, of uh, uh, going away, like going away from the, from the food that's there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And what would you do instead? that helps to like. Um, well, and I think that would be a good, good opportunity to like, you know, like leave the room to assess those, uh, do that mind, body, heart thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do some of the uh, awareness tools, right? Awareness and mindfulness tools. You could do some of the, what are my triggers, feelings, needs, what actions will be helpful, right? Um, it, I mean, other things to redirect my focus might be, um, yeah. doing, doing something else that I enjoy. Yeah, and when they talk about redirecting your focus, they want you to do things that helps you to feel, to help distract, but, to revitalize you, to relax you, and to nurture you. That's what their, their three things that they want people to focus on is, what are things that I can do to distract myself that revitalizes me, relaxes me, and nurture me? And if I move towards those activities, I'm much more likely to feel um, pleasure and satisfaction in other ways, other than just turning to food, even though food is always a legitimate option, right? <clears throat> Yeah, so you said things, do things I enjoyed, like what? Uh, well, I mean, it's kind of hard right now, but like, I mean, I mean, dancing would be one of those things that yeah. I, I love that you love to dance. And, uh, <laughs> uh, recently, between, you know, like, things opening up and then sort of closing again and opening back up again, closing again. Um, I missed that last piece. It's sort of like waxing and waiting from, from, you know, with COVID, with things kind of opening. Oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's been kind of crazy. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know, doing something, doing something that is enjoyable. Uh, I mean, definitely mm -hmm. the dancing, maybe. Uh, you know, making a phone call maybe, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it could be helpful in this, I had put in the notes from the PowerPoints, like have your client make an exhaustive list that they can turn to. Cause th this, this is just the beginning where their cogs are just turning and they're brainstorming, but having an exhaustive list of things that will revitalize, relax and nurture them uh, will be powerful to have in place that this is something I can turn to that can, can really help me in the moment. And then I could also connect with my needs and address my true needs, whether I'm feeling lonely or disconnected that I actually go on a date or put myself out there um, or do something that ultimately fills me up more when, when the food doesn't work. 
seeing Hannah's chat made me realize, oh my gosh, it's five o'clock. The time just flew by like that. Um, and yeah, there was a piece where I wanted to try the um, binge restrict voice versus the compassionate wise self. So in one of the books, they have like a eating disorder voice that talks to the healthy self. And I thought that would be cool in externalization of voices. Um, but yeah, it is five o'clock. So you, you all could just imagine doing externalization of voices with your client. And then there's a binge restrict voice. The binge tells them to go ahead and binge, like eat to the point of discomfort. And the restrict says, oh, you need to not do that in order to um, have a sense of control. And then you let them talk back to it with their compassionate wise self. So that, that body wisdom, what does it say to them instead? Right. Um, and I think that could be a cool exercise um, that we could uh, bring to life for our clients there. And then um, from there, I just want to thank everyone for being here. Um, but an, a special thank you for Urban for being so open and vulnerable in this process. If those of you who need to go because it's already 502, um, feel free to do that. And then I will send you all the rest of the recording on this. Um, my browser wasn't working for me to pull up. I see in the chat some people are asking about the, the binge eating workbook. It is in the marketplace, but it's a specific book set um, that has the book and the workbook in there. And it's called the binge eating book set or something like that. And you could just buy the book on Amazon, like on Kindle, it's just $9.95 instead of the 19 from their website. And then the workbook you could order separately, that's $19.95. Um, okay, let me see if there's any other questions and then I, I'd like uh, Urban to wrap up with what it's like for him. Is it helpful to visualize not only what it would be like when you are recovered, but to visualize a time that was negative when not yet recovered and then compare it to the moment. Oh, that, that's an interesting thought. Stacy. I think that's a creative way to approach it. Um, in the resources that I've read, they had visual imaging for my life when I'm recovered. I think because they like people to get into a space where um, the more you practice it mentally, the more you're likely to follow through behaviorally. And it may be more of like changing behavior through the carrot uh, with positive change versus like now imagine when you're not doing that and using punishment to change behavior, which isn't as, as effective actually. And so um, what they see even like people like um, athletes where they just practice mentally and um, they're almost as good as people who practice like for a week, like shooting baskets, the people who just shot baskets mentally like just had like a few points less when they actually engaged in it. So they do see visualization being powerful when we focus on doing well. And it does create different um, muscle memory for our body just when we visualize it there. Okay, let me see if there's any other thoughts. Okay, thank you so much, Kate um, and Lorna for joining us all the way from Australia. And I feel a little bit badly we couldn't get through more, but um, we got a, a good chunk of it in in the past two hours. Do you have any other thoughts or questions, um, Urban, on just this process so far and going through that, um, looking at different ways to redirect your focus, what to do, understanding more of your true needs in that moment? Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, I, I really am appreciative for the, uh, the, my, the mind, body, heart thing that you put up. Okay, uh, cool. I, it, it was not something that I had actually uh thought about or, or, or remembered or anything like that um but i think that that, that would be that's definitely something that i would take away from this um, awesome yeah um because more of that mindfulness and awareness of our bodies starts to change the behaviors is yeah. what they notice so and i think there's i think there's uh i, I mean, i'm also curious about some of the other things that you, that you that we didn't obviously have time to get to but yeah <laughs> It's a whole 10 week process, so it makes yeah. sense. <laughs> and we're trying to incorporate in with team as well. So um, we, I may be able to do another one once I take the full course and have a deeper understanding of the whole journey that I could share with you all a little bit more when I have a deeper understanding of the process. Um, did anyone else have any other thoughts or questions for me or for Urban before we wrap up today? 
And again, if you need to go, please go ahead and do that. Tayan, <clears throat> thank you so much, Urban and Tayan. It's always so enriching. I was going to ask you a question. Do they mention anything about fasting? About fasting, um, let me try to remember. I, I, it doesn't come off the top of my head from the binge eating book. Um, I know they talked about it in the eight keys book that um, if people are severely restricting that they wouldn't recommend any kind of like vegan diet, fasting, anything that could become part of that restrictive process that leads to worsening the anorexia or bulimia. Um, but I don't necessarily remember that in the binge eating book. Um, because I think there is a lot of studies, um, scientific studies on the benefits of fasting. Um, and the other book also talked about it too. Um, but when there is severe restrictive eating, um, it, it could actually be more dangerous for them to engage in that instead of health, healthful. Did you have other thoughts on that, Marina? No, it just makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Any other thoughts or questions about this process? Okay, I think that's it then. Well, thank you so much um, everyone for joining. And um, just wishing you the best in this process, Urban. I'll email you some of the resources if you're needing additional support, um, which I think could be beneficial for you. Really rooting for you as well on this journey. I've just found you to be so likable, uh, such a kind-hearted spirit. I could see just your care for those boys that you help. And um, yeah, I love that you love to dance. I love just different aspects that you've shared about yourself with us. And, truly rooting for you in this process after connecting with you um, where life can be free of like um, having to be mentally consumed by food and eating right where you could just be a bit more free from it that that sounds really liberating in this process um do i see a, a hand raised up okay yeah feel free to just jump in and share hi Ty. and i would like to thank you for this course as all of the ones that you always give us. And Urban, I have a question for you. How, how has it been the last few weeks for you to handle all this information and all this personal work that you've been going through? Uh, I mean, it's, it's definitely been on my mind. Um, so I... I I mean, I think it's been it's been helpful in sort of uh, making me more aware of other things, other factors, um, and understanding that it's 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 a really bigger, you know, uh, it's a bigger process than <laughs> like I mean, it's it's never going to be simple, but I mean, it, it just that it, it is a big process, and that it's okay that it's a big process. Um, it, I mean, initially, I had a lot of a lot of disappointment because I wasn't where I wanted to be uh, by a certain date, and so that that was a bit of a setback. But now it's like, well, you know, that's okay. We just have to like reset the goal line <laughs> and sort of try to try it again. Um, so yeah, it's 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 definitely been useful, uh, and, and I think some of the stuff from today, especially. Uh, well, I'll have to like do some reflecting on it, really sort of ingrain it into my process and, and, the and, and just sort of, you know, I, I have a little bit of excitement to see where this is going to go. Uh, you know, like I said, it, it, it's, it's worth, definitely worth, worth trying uh, to, to see what I can do. Thank you for sharing and, and for the, all the hard work that you've been going through. And I admire your work with the kids that you said today. And congratulations. Yeah, so it just helped you see the complexity and that it's, it is a bigger process that doesn't just take like, oh, just stop. 
or like it's just about the pleasure and if you could control yourself then it, it'd be all all better right yeah it's a lot more complex and i mean we're happy to hear the excitement i think in the excitement there's a little bit of hope it, it reflects hope that there can be change and there can be something different for me in this process right yeah cool and thank you, Sori, for your question as well on what that's been like for Urban. Okay, anything else before we wrap up for today? Thank you so much for having us from Australia and lovely Thanks. to meet you so much. Thank you so much, Taya and Urban. Thank you for um, sharing all your um, processes today. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Kate and, and Lorna from Australia and uh, wishing everyone a great week as well. And I look forward to when we can reconnect again, our next family reunion. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. We'll be in touch. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.